joining us. It's with great pleasure that I welcome Carl Louis to the uh, Meet the Team sessions. Um, Carl is here to discuss uh, provenance as a guide to evaluate philatelic importance. Um, Carl has been a philatelist since the early 1970s as a collector and an exhibitor, and since 1986, intermittently as a professional philatelist. Since 2006, he has been the managing director of Corin Villa, as well as affiliated companies in Germany and the Netherlands. Since 2012, he has also been a fellow partner in Corin Villa Group Global Philatelic Network. His personal collecting area is Great Britain, 1840 to 1901. Since 1988, Carl has built up a card index of all the major items in classical Great Britain philately, comprising both traditional and postal history material. Welcome, Carl, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, yes, I have just a, a five or maximum 10 minutes uh, talk to you about, as you mentioned, Isabel, provenance as a guide to evaluate philatelic importance. So let us first talk or let us first uh, do a definition of provenance and a definition of philatelic importance and, and what is the relation between the two. So provenance, I would say, is the, the knowledge where an item was in the past, in what collections, who owned it, and um, when and where it was possibly offered and sold, especially on auctions. Philatelic importance, this we could discuss for two days, as we had uh, three years ago by our group of the Global Philatelic Network, a special meeting in Stockholm for two days with 10, uh, with 10 talks about this. So philatelic importance, this is what makes an item extraordinary or important for, for its collecting field. Um, it relates also to how many collectors um, collect a certain field and need the rarity. <clears throat> and uh, especially for new collectors or for collectors not so familiar with the collecting field, possibly because they have started just recently a new field, a new challenge in philately. Um, provenance may be a guide for them to identify the really the really important items for their field. I just want to show you a few items from a very difficult collecting field as an example, and these are the British post offices used abroad. Um, many of, of you may know that uh, the British post installed in the 19th century all over the world, British post offices and gave them special numbers in their cancellation. So what is rare, what is important and what is common? So it's difficult. And if you see any items offered, you, it may be a help and a guidance if you know that this item being offered and you think about acquiring or not was already in an earlier collection. So let's go into this um, collecting field of the British Post Office is abroad. And we see that over the last 100 years, we had four or five important collections, which were always the leading collection at their time. The first collection or collector for uh, British Post Office abroad was Yates in the 1920s, 30s and 40s then followed by Bertram McGowan in the 1930s to 50s. One of the most famous was J. Grant Glasgow in 1950-60, sold by Robson Lowe in 1969. And all the key items of this collecting field then went to Andre Bollen, uh, who sold his collection in the 1980s. 
And then presently the collection, which is sold, offered and sold under the pseudonym of Dubois, possibly contains all the major pieces. So having said this, have a look at some items, which especially a new collector connect, cannot, cannot identify whether important or not. And um, the way auction houses presently present these rarities is mentioning the provenance at the end of the description, mostly with the, uh, not only the name of the collector, of the former owner, but also when and where sold, including lot numbers. And I think a very easy and nice guy is, guide is if the, uh, the former collectors are being illustrated together with the item. So I've, this example is, for example, um, a very rare cover from Antofagasta. The cancellation never seen, or let's say nearly never seen, especially for a new collector. But if you know that Louise Boyde Lichtenstein, Alfred Lichtenstein, her father, and Andre Bollen were the former owners, this immediately gives you the idea that this item must be important for the collecting field. It must be philatelically important. Another item from Peru, for example, um, shows a Peruvian cancellation and not the British post office cancellation. And the question is, how important is it? But if we go into the past, if we look, what we can find about this item means um, we find it in, even in Yates, 1940. We found it in the Glasgow collection. We found it in Andre Bollen's collection. So if all these three heroes of British philately, or let's say of British post offices abroad philately, owned this item, this certainly is a good guide that this must be one of the most important in relation, in, uh, relation to philatelic importance. Another cover, again, is uh, this uh, overland mail cover from Trieste to China. Here you, we can see that some of these covers or items from the British post offices abroad, they sometimes they went through all the collections of the specialists of the collecting fields. But on the other hand, they also might have gone into collections of, let's say, an Egypt collector, because the cover went to Egypt and the British stamp was uh, postmarked in Alexandria in Egypt. For example, Bayem was an Egypt collector and he was, he is a in the row of the uh, important provenances. So again, the longer the pedigree is, the longer the pedigree of provenances is, and the more important names are being mentioned, we can be nearly sure that the item must have a high philatelic importance for the collecting field. This may possibly also be shown with this item, which does not look very important. It is a, a cover which I would normally say, okay, we are done at 200, 250, 300 uh, sterling. But it shows a date of 10 September 1857. So it is the earliest known usage of the British stamps in Gibraltar, cancelled by the Gibraltar. J Barrett numeral, and the cover has been part of the J Grant Glasgow collection, part of the Andre Bollen collection. So this underlines the importance for this cover for the postal history of Gibraltar. 
So provenance again guides you to the important items. Another item and uh, the rarity you will see only, let's say at a second glance, not at the first glance, um, you can see that the Tanga, the British post office in Tanga date stamp and have a look at the N, the letter N of Tanga. It is reversed. And there are only six or seven covers known with this date stamp with the reversed N in Tanga. And this is possibly the nicest of the seven. But again, the list of the former owners, the list of the uh, famous provenances, starting with Yates in 1939, with Taylor in 1960, with Grant Glasgow in 1969, just simply confirms the high philatelic important, importance again for the collecting field. This as a short introduction, and I would like to chat with you to answer your questions on provenances, on the importance of provenances for philately, and especially on the provenances for philatelic importance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. That was brilliant. Um, so basically, to ask Carl a question, all you need to do is unmute yourself um, and ask, or please do put it in the um, chat box. I have a question. Yes, the son. Okay. Um, I was just wondering how many people or kind of what percentage of people want to actually remain anonymous regarding their collections? I did not understand your question. Can you? So, it's, so we hear sometimes that there's um, people placing um, bids in auctions, but they don't want their name to be shared. Ah, in the auctions. So I was just wondering if when you are mapping provenance out, if there are any um, gaps because people don't want other people, yep. they are the ones that have had the stamps. It's, it's, our experience is our experience is that more and more, more people do not hesitate to have her names mentioned when a collection is being sold. Sometimes we have pseudonyms like Dubois, but more and more we have the clear names of the collectors. And I must say, especially in, uh, in earlier times of philatelic auctions in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, we have, we have seen many, many what we call name sales with the clear name of the collector. And uh, it is still the situation today. Um, it may well be that we have a provenance with a pseudonym name, like there's a famous British stamp collection was, which was named Daisy. Daisy was the daughter of the collector. Okay. But uh, over the years, it became clear who it was in real. But the provenance given in a lot description will always be ex Daisy Collection 1996. Okay. But uh, let me just add we have our group publishes um, a series of books which we call Edition d'Or or Edition d'Or. And uh, in, we have now published more than 60 books and each book contains one collection that has been exhibited on international exhibitions and was awarded large gold or Grand Prix. And um, we have a long list of collectors who want to publish their collections in these books and they are always published under their clear name. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carl. Simon, I can see you are unmuted. Did you want to ask a question? Or I, just no, put I was just spot? wondering how, um, whether exhibitors ought to put the provenance into their exhibit. Is it um, showing off? I, th I think in the UK, we'd be a little reticent about it. It's like we don't really like some of those red boxes, but it seems to me quite important. And one of my exhibits of classic Victoria I have started putting provenances in because I do think it helps, but I wonder what your feeling was. Simon, you're absolutely right. I know it's being discussed, but if 
a provenance is a guide for the collector to identify philatelic importance. I am sure it is really a helpful tool and guide for the judges when they judge a collection to identify the important items. And I must say, I would very much prefer to mention provenances in, a, in an exhibit because it helps not only the collector, it helps the judges and it certainly helps the viewers, the visitors inspecting a collection in the frames to identify the important items. It helps, it's a guide. Yeah, that's, that's, that's perhaps a good idea, actually. You could put it around the important items, couldn't you? And that would show why you put it in just yes. for those selectively to highlight the, the real key pieces. Yes, oh, that, a very easy good. tool and easy to understand for all of us. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Carl. Has anyone, would anyone else like to ask any um, questions? Paul, I think I see yeah. you from muted. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, uh, how important is it to be able to track the full provenance from start to finish? I mean, collectors are not unknown to exchange material even from a high level, uh, which then appears in another collection. Do you, how, how do you deal with that? Um, you cannot have a full list of all owners for important items. This is nearly impossible. If, if items change hands privately and not publicly on auction or through dealer's list with illustrations, then we don't have the provenance. Provenance must also be proven that it is not just the fantasy of the owner of, the, of an item, but it must be proven that it has really been in this collection or on this auction. Um, it's getting, yeah, it's getting more and more important. And the problem is, and you're right, tracing the item or tracing the provenances for a certain item. And this is uh, where we need and hope, and I hope to motivate as many collectors as possible to build up similar card indexes, registers or indexes, which I have compiled over the last 30 years for Great Britain, the Victoria issues from 1840 to 1901. Whenever I meet collectors, uh, I try to motivate them for their special topic and collecting field to, to start and to build up such a census and to open it for the philatelic public, public um, as much as possible. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you. Would anyone else like to ask Carl a, a question? Yeah, hi, it's uh, Kim Stuckey here. Uh, what about new discoveries, Carl, that may be more important than one with a, ones with good provenance? How would you handle that? Yes, new discoveries, you're right. They cannot have a provenance except for let's say the family where they have been the last 150 or 70 years. Um, so the provenance is the find. So if you have a new find, or if you have a, let's say a, a, a family correspondence coming up out of the blue, and then we should try to, um, to fix the situation or the find as such for the future. And we should describe it with the item that is being offered, either through a dealer's list or through an auction, but tell the story when and where the new find came up. Yeah, so for example, it's X family archive or something like that. We should give the find a name like, um, yeah, the family archive, the uh, the addressee or whatsoever. The, the, the find should get a name. We should uh, invest some fantasy in it, but it should be, uh, it should the story should be told of the find. And I think this is part of the fascination of philately. So we all want to grab out such a new find, but 
If you do so, tell the story to others whenever the items are being sold. Thank you. Carl, I had something, um, a question that came in that was probably more related to Suzanne's question as well. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed it before it came into the chat. Um, it's just um, with regard to um, anonymous collectors. So the question yes. is, at some point, an anonymous collector's name becomes known, like Dubois. Do you use the real name at some point or always maintain the anonymous name? We will always maintain the anonymous, na anonym anonymous name because on the auction catalog, the anonymous name is being mentioned. If we are the auction house uh, that sells a collection under the anonymous, anonymous name, we will never mention the clear name, always, never in the future, even not in 10, 20 or 30 days, uh, years. If other parties in the market mention the clear name, it is not our problem. But the auction house respects that the consigners decided to use a, 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 a pseudonym or anonymous name. And uh, we will always respect this. So many know who is the clear name, but we will never mention the name, never. Thank you, Carl. Would anyone else like to ask Carl a question? With your card indexes, Carl, do, do you keep pictures from each of the auction sales so that you can see whether or not any of these covers have been improved over the years? Yes, very easy. Um, for the same item, I may have three, four, five, six, or seven, or even more index cards because I do not check if I work out an auction catalog to put the relevant and important items into the card index. I do not check if, it have, if I have it already recorded or not. And uh, such an index card always has an illustration, the description, the source, the catalog number, and the date where and when it was offered on it. I don't know if you can see, I have an index card just here. This is a typical index card. Yes, it's a good illustration, is with the description, is with the, let's say, auction house or dealer's list, is with the catalog number and the date. And if, for example, this has been uh, offered variously, this is another index card with the same item and uh, you see and this was part of my or this was my talk the topic of my talk yesterday you can see whether items have been improved or not if margins have been grown or a perforation is grown or whatsoever you will see it and by comparing the illustrations on the index cards with the illustrations from former auctions or from former years. You can see in the background, by the way, part of my card index register. And um, these are all boxes. Each box contains about five to 600 index cards. And I have now 140 or 145 boxes. So um, the number of entries, the number of index cards should Meanwhile, exceed 90 or 100,000 uh, cards or items, let's say items. Now you, you've set new standards for all of us, Carl. It's, it, it's salutary. I, I'm very impressed with what you do in the catalogs. And I've started to improve my own databases and recording more now. <laughs> Super. It's a what big are you job, recording? Though. Simon, what are you I recording? I recorded in a... In a spreadsheet database really program yeah. rather than cards but yeah 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 the, the question is do you do it digitally or on index cards so since i started in 1986 i stuck now to the index cards because i don't want to start again from scratch no. <laughs> it, it, it's a great but job we can, we, simon we can always exchange information on certain topics i'm always open to any collector to any collector to exchange information. Thank you.
and this is of course for free it's my hobby yeah don't it's my hobby brilliant thank you so much has anyone um else um got a question yes hello this is michael perm sorry i was late to the talk i would have okay. a question um do you also, uh, it was possibly mentioned in the talk, do you also um, check other like public auctions for high visibility items for high, for no, of course not for the simple ones, but for higher visibility items? And would you record the passing of such an item in another uh, auction, uh, Sotheby's or something bigger in your catalog? Yes, of course, we would do so. So a provenance is independent from the auction house or from the collector. So um, I have no problems, of course not, to mention any other auction houses like uh, Siegel, Spink, Feldman, whatsoever to mention as a provenance when they sold an important stamp or item. And um, Yes, it's part of the provenance, so and we all have to accept. It's not only from our own auctions. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Any other final questions for Carl? Can I ask one final? Can I ask one final question? It's Kim again. Of course. Carl, do you do you have a um, a lower limit of the sort of items you look at? Because obviously uh, there's a lot of things being auctioned at once. So you're right. Uh, wh where do you set your limit, or is it in a particular area or areas no, no. or whatever? My limit is, let's say, the area is Great Britain Victoria issues 1840 to 1901. So this is very limited. And then you have to have a border to the common uh, items uh, because otherwise you would stuck. So I made a list when I started. I had a very good advisor and he said, Carl, before you start, think about what you include and what not include. Otherwise you get mad. And so I made a list. For example, I'll give you an example. From the Penny Black, I start from strips of four used, Penny Black used. I record everything from let's say strips of four and larger covers with four stems on all or more. Or it must have a, a rare variety. Let's say from the Penny Black Plate 11, I record all single stems, all covers, all multiples. But if you try this, I had just this morning a communi an email communication with a request for provenances. Um, if you would try to record every, let's say, Penny Black, even a Penny Black on cover, impossible impossible so you have from the beginning on make the borders where you think about what to include and what not to include this was the best recommendation i got 33 years ago yeah that sounds really good <laughs> thank you the, for you on if you go on, um, on the corin fila website you will find as an example my list of items that is that are being included. So this gives you a very good impression of how you can compile such a list and decide what to include or not. You will find it on www.corinfila.ch. And also if you visit our booth, there is a link from our booth from Stampex also to this list. Have a look. And you can Thank contact you. me all whenever you want uh, later on if there are any questions remaining. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining us. I think that was excellent. I'm just going to hand over to um, Suzanne Ray, the chair for the PTS. It's just a really, really quick one, Carl. Just thank you so much for all of the time that you and your team have um, contributed to all these um, collective support sessions and meet the team sessions. And thank you for sponsoring the Collectors Lounge. It was a new concept for this uh, show uh, and it takes a brave man to jump in with us. Uh, and yep. do, So thank you so much um, and uh, we we'll look forward to the next. I think we're about 50, 50 odd hours still to go. Okay. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Isabel. No problems. And just um, for everyone else, I think that, Carl, will you be back on the booth? 
just after this? If anyone's yes, got of any course. questions? Yes, of course. In two, three minutes. Yes. Perfect. Great stuff. Thank Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>